Hello, my name is Commander Dave Skanky. I'm the Director of the Division of Lifecycle API. Joining me today is Commander Ben Danso, the Lead DMF Project Manager from the Office of Program and Regulatory Operations. And we're going to talk to you today about effective communication strategies for drug master files. So let's talk a little bit about the ways the agency communicates to DMF holders and applicants uh, about the DMF. Uh, clearly, we communicate with the DMF holder uh, in the administrative and the review letters that we provide them, uh, through teleconferences and email exchanges, through the informational letters that we provide, through informal uh, queries and status updates that we provide to DMF holders, and through publicly available posted information like the available for reference list. Although we're more limited in what we can say about the DMF to the applicant or the authorized party, we communicate with them uh, by providing status updates to the DMF in the CR letters that they receive in response to their uh, queries to us um, through facility related early IRs and again through public posted information like the available for reference list. Some of the most important communication occurs directly between the DMF holder and the applicant. And Although FDA doesn't have a direct role in this communication, we do view our role as being a facilitator. Uh, how can we facilitate the, the communication between the DMF holder and the applicant? We do that by making sure they both have timely and up-to-date, accurate information about the drug master file. Um, in talks such as this uh, and other talks throughout the workshop, we point out the, the key timing of communications between the DMF holder and the applicant in the, in the overall review process. Uh, and we can share observations uh, with where we see pitfalls uh, and, and areas that can be improved uh, to make the overall review process smoother. Let's talk a little bit about what information the FDA can share with the applicant and the DMF holder regarding the drug master file. With the DMF holder, we're not restricted with what we can talk to them about regarding their DMF. Uh, anything that's public information, of course, we can share. We can provide them status information. We can discuss the confidential administrative information, uh, information related to fees and completeness assessments. We can discuss confidential review information related to the technical content of the drug master file. What we can't share with the DMF holder is confidential application status information, such as goal dates, because these belong specifically to the application and are the property of the applicant. Uh, with the applicant, we are much more restricted on what we can share. We're basically limited to public information that's available about the drug master file, available for reference list or quarterly inventory list, and status information. Uh, like the information you see us put in the um, application CR letters, where it's just very generic statements about what the review status is of that drug master file. We can't share any confidential administrative or review information related to the technical content of the DMF, because all that is protected pr proprietary information. So for the rest of this talk, we're going to break it down into formal and informal communication pathways. Uh, the formal communication pathways, of course, are the review letters that you receive, the DMF CR, IR, additional comment, uh, DMF incomplete letters in the case of completeness assessments, um, the informational letters, FA, NFC, uh, general advice letters, uh, formally granted teleconferences, uh, and formally granted email exchanges, um, and then also controlled correspondence. Uh, Commander Danso will take you through most of these uh, so that you have a good understanding uh, of these communications uh, and how to use them as effectively as possible during the DMF and application review process. I will then come back and discuss uh, informal communication. These are communication mechanisms outside the formal communication channels uh, and mostly consist of responses to email queries that we receive. 
Um, I put voice queries there because occasionally do we do receive those, uh, but it's mostly responses to email queries. Uh, and I will describe for you how to use these communication mechanisms uh, most effectively um, to improve the DMF and application review process. Commander Danso, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Commander Skenchi, for this presentation and introduction. Now, let's look at DMF Complete Response Ladder. Do for DMF complete response or CR letter is the most common deficiency communication issue to drug master files. It is only issued against type 2 DMFs in support of under submissions. This letter includes questions from all review disciplines, including consoles and possibly status of facilities in association with the DMF. CR letter is divided into two sections. A and B. Deficiencies listed in Section A must be resolved prior to the approval of a reference application, whereas what is listed in Section B could be minor clarification comments that do not render a DMF inadequate. It is critical to understand that the issuance of the DMF CR letter is, in heavily, is heavily dependent on key timelines for the reference application for which the DMF review is being conducted. The DMF CR letter is typically issued one to three weeks before the mid-cycle due date or one week before the end of cycle due date of the reference application. Once a CR letter is issued for a DMF, it is now qualified as inadequate and therefore cannot support an approval action of any pending reference application. Please also note that a DMF review cycle is considered closed once a CR letter is issued. At this point, the DMF can only be referenced in the CR letter to the reference application. DMF complete response letters. When you receive a DMF CR letter, please pay close attention to the entire letter and the timelines. Don't forget that your response action plays a key role in the review timelines of the reference application. A missed timeline is considered a late response. The response timeline indicated in the letter is impacted by any major or minor deficiencies. Response to major deficiencies has a shorter timeline since it typically takes longer to review. For this reason, a response must be received no less than 120 days prior to the goal date. For minors, the response must be received no less than 90 days prior to the goal date. On-time responses will, will be considered for review during the application review cycle. We, however, do not guarantee an additional DMF review cycle for late response. Please remember to send a notification of response to the DMF OGD mailbox as this ensures a timely assignment to the review staff. Note that teleconference are only for first cycle letters and email exchange are available should you need further clarification on the contents of the CR letter. DMF holders may request for a CR letter response timeline extension when you cannot meet the timeline provided in the letter. Your request is either granted or denied. A deny means that your extension request will hinder our ability to meet the reference application's goal date. Under these circumstances, your request is denied and a CR letter is sent to the reference application. DMF Deficiency Letter This type of deficiency letter is, from a regulatory perspective, no different than a DMF CR letter. It is used in an instance where the requirements for using the GDU for DMF CR letter does not apply. An example is DMF that is referenced by other DMFs. This is commonly referred to as a secondary DMF, or when a review of a DMF is conducted to support a non gadu for submission, such as an NDA or IND. Please note that a DMF deficiency letter does not contain facility status information. Again, timelines are crucial and the impact are no different from that of a CR letter. A secondary DMF deficiency letter renders it inadequate and therefore cannot support an approval action of any uh, pending reference DMF or application. Thus, the review cycle is closed. A new cycle of review will not open until a response to all issues in the DMF deficiency is received. Teleconference option is not available, but email exchange is supported for the DMF deficiency letter. Response timeline is indicated in the cover sheet of the letter. Missed timeline is considered a late response. No teleconference for secondary DMF and email exchange options are available. DMF information request letter. 
The DMF information request letter was previously referred to under the do for one as easily correctable deficiency letter. It is issued to communicate deficiencies in cases where the holder should be able to respond quickly and get the DMF to an adequate status within the current review cycle. It is therefore usually used relatively late in an under review cycle, typically 30 days before a QDD when under approval is a likely outcome. When an IRA is issued, the regulatory status of the DMF is pending and therefore cannot support an approval action of any pending reference application until all IRA issues are resolved. The review cycle of a DMF under IRA status remains open and not finalized to allow for an immediate review of the IRA response upon receipt. You may receive error comments where the timelines seem unrealistic based on what is being asked. This is because we try and err on the side of giving the holder a chance to respond rather than making assumptions that a rapid response is not possible. A missed timeline is considered a late response and the comments will be converted to a CR letter and the DMF review cycle is closed. DMF additional comment letter. The DMF Additional Comments Letter serves a unique regulatory purpose. It is used to address very minor comments to the holder. It does not render the DMF inadequate. To be clear, the regulatory status of a DMF is adequate and can support an approval action even when an AC letter has been issued. This adequate status can also trigger the issuance of a first adequate letter when appropriate. It is also worth noting that DMF adequate status triggers the issuance of no further comment letters too. Please note that in order to avoid quick response to AC letters from interfering with the action timeline for the reference application, we now issue these after the under. We do recommend that you try to respond within 60 days if possible, but there is no set response timeline for an AC letter. If a response will take longer than 60 days, please email DMF OGD to ensure your response will not interfere with an action timeline. DMF incomplete letter. The DMF incomplete letter is issued during the completion assessment process. It is essentially an information request to let the holder know what additional information is needed to pass the CA. This renders the DMF incomplete and makes it ineligible to appear on the available for reference list. This prevents OGD from filing an under which references the DMF and could result in a refuse to receive action on an application. Upon issuance of the incomplete letter, the CA review cycle closes. There is no set time for a response, but we do recommend responding as quickly as possible so that there are not delays for your customers submitting the application or risk of receiving an RTR. It is critical that you always notify the DMF OGD mailbox as instructed in the letter when you submit your response. If no email notification is provided, the CA stands the possible risk of sitting idle in an incomplete status. Informational letters. FDA issues several types of formal informational letters that communicate timely status or other important information to the DMF holder about the DMF. The DMF first adequate or FA letter, which is new under GDUFA 2, is issued when a DMF review under GDUFA is found adequate for the first time. We strive to issue these letters within 30 days of the finalization of the first adequate review. Typically, you will only receive one FA letter during the life cycle of the DMF. However, if the first cycle review covered multiple reference applications, then you will receive a copy of the letter individually citing each. These letters are useful in facilitating communication between the DMF holder and applicant about the real-time review status of the DMF. Over 300 FA letters are issued annually. The DMF No Further Comment Letters is issued to the DMF holder when the reference application is approved under GDUFA. We also strive to issue the NFC letters within 30 days of the approval action on the reference application. You will receive multiple NFC letters of the life cycle of the DMF. We typically issue about 1,000 NFC letters annually. Please note that we do give a higher priority to the FA letter than the NFC letter when there is a backlog of letters to process. If you believe we owe an FA or NFC letter, please send a query to the DMF OGD mailbox. Teleconferences. 
two formal communication mechanisms outside of the letters that FDA issues that are available to the DMF holder are the GDU for teleconference and the email exchange. These allow the DMF holder to get clarification on the contents of the letters prior to submitting a response. FDA will grant teleconference when requested to clarify first cycle DMF deficiency letters only. DMF holders must request a teleconference in writing within 20 business days of receipt of the first cycle DMFCR letter, identifying specific issues to be addressed. For more details on the TCON process, please see the poster, Teleconference Process Outline, by myself, Benjamin Denso, and Jayani Pereira. Email Exchange DMF email exchange was first introduced under GDUFA 2 and has become by far the preferred communication mechanism pathway by industry to get clarity regarding deficiencies. There is about 10 to 1 request ratio between email exchange to teleconference. We strive to respond within 30 days of receipt of the initial email exchange request, but we typically respond in less than, one, less than 20 days. We are very flexible on what qualifies as email exchange and will respond to requests generated from any cycle of review or type of review letter issued. We prefer to receive these requests within 20 business days of receipt of the letter, but we will not deny the request if it comes in later. Please know that you are eligible for one follow-up exchange after receiving the initial response if adequate clarity is needed. Please know that when you submit the email exchange request, it should include all queries about the letter. The process is not designed to receive multiple requests for the same letter in a piecemeal fashion. Thank you, and I hand it over to Commander Skanchi. Thank you very much, Commander Danso. Now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about informal communication strategies that you can use as a DMF holder or an applicant to obtain answers to your questions regarding the drug master file status or other more technical related questions. Um, informal communication, and by that I'm largely referring to the email queries that you send to our various email inboxes, um, has a lot of benefits. Uh, one of which is that you can receive very quick answers. Typically, we can respond in one to three business days to these informal email queries. Um, it's an appropriate communication pathway for a wide variety of questions. It's great for status updates on the drug master file. It's great for getting answers to non-review related technical questions. Um, the Division of Life Cycle API alone responds to about 3,000 informal queries annually via email. Um, and 90% of the queries that we receive are appropriate for this type of response. Uh, it's relatively rare that we have to refer you to a more formal type of communication pathway to get your answer. I'd also like to point out that Informal communication pathways are a good place to start. Um, we triage all the queries so that they get sent to the appropriate subject matter expert. Uh, we respond with appropriate mailbox information if a request comes to us and we're not the appropriate experts to answer that question. Um, and if we deem that it's not appropriate for an informal response, we will refer you to a more formal mechanism appropriate to your question if needed. I'd just like to talk a little bit now about how we process email queries that come to us. In Delapi, we uh, operate two main mailboxes for uh, DMF and API related questions. Uh, that's the DMF OGD mailbox and the Cedar DMF question mailbox. Uh, I want to point out that we are in constant communication uh, with the folks that manage other mailboxes so that we can get appropriate subject matter expertise regardless of which mailbox uh, the query happens to come into. Um, we recommend uh, that if you have a DMF or API related question um, and you don't know exactly where to send it, that you start with either the DMF OGD or CEDAR DMF question mailbox. 
course, if you know that, say, for example, Cedar eSub is the appropriate place, go ahead and send it there. But if you have any doubt, starting with DMF OGD or Cedar DMF question um, is the way to go. Um, since the managers of the mailboxes are all in communication with each other, uh, I'd like to point out that it is not an effective strategy to send a single query to multiple inboxes at the same time. That just wastes our resources because we have multiple people triaging the same thing. Here are some tips for sending effective email queries to us. As I mentioned, please send your query to a single FDA email inbox. This helps us be as efficient as possible in processing your email queries. Uh, please clearly identify yourself and your role. Are you the holder? Are you the agent? Are you the authorized party? This helps us determine what type of information regarding the DMF that we can appropriately share with you. Um, using your company email account really helps us in this regard because we can readily confirm your relationship to the drug master file. In your queries, provide as much detail as possible include appropriate attachments. Uh, if you're asking us about a, an appropriate starting material designation, go ahead and include the synthetic scheme. Uh, make sure you double check references to the specific DMF and application numbers. Um, and again, the more detail you can provide, uh, the better able we are to give you an accurate and timely answer to your query. Um, we recommend that you avoid framing queries as hypotheticals when possible. If you're talking about a real situation, then just fully describe it to us. It helps us give you the most appropriate answer to your query. In order to help us process the email queries as effectively as possible, we do have some recommendation as to the best mailbox to send certain types of queries to. We recommend using the DMF OGD mailbox for DMF review status updates for response notifications as instructed in our letter templates, for technical or policy questions related to API review, uh, for GDUFA questions related to DMFs, noting that some fee-related questions will require OM input, um, facility-related questions, uh, questions about NFC and FA letters, um, email exchange requests and teleconference requests, uh, queries about completeness assessments and the available for reference list. Uh, anytime you just can't figure out where to send the query and somehow it's related to a DMF or API, start with DMF OGD first. Please use the DMF question mailbox for the following types of queries. For general queries about DMFs, for administrative queries about DMFs, uh, for questions about FDA forms and letter templates for drug master files, for general questions based on information on the FDA DMF webpage, for questions about submitting type 5 DMFs, for questions about type 3 and type 4 DMFs. I'd just like to take a minute to talk about controlled correspondence, uh, which is a formal communication pathway uh, that we will refer you to uh, when we get uh, email query uh, that it's just not appropriate for us to provide an informal response to. Uh, this typically occurs uh, when, an, uh, when, when a question involves new policy, setting new precedent, um, is associated with pending guidance, uh, or for any other reason that we're just not comfortable providing an informal email response. Um, these do have uh, GDUFA mandated uh, timelines, so although it will take a little bit longer to get a response, uh, you will get a response in a set timeline. Um, control correspondences are submitted to OGD, uh, and the quality issues are then referred to our policy office in OPQ. Um, most of the time, the quality office will reach out to subject matter experts in the Division of Life Cycle API, so we will actually be participating in answering uh, controlled correspondence queries uh, a lot of the time. 
So we do get quite a few controlled correspondence uh, in OPQ. Uh, during FY 2020, there were about 815 controlled correspondences uh, that were responded to. Um, about 50 of these uh, were specifically related to drug substance questions, um, with the most frequent categories being impurity limits, uh, questions about acceptability of the starting material, uh, questions involving sameness issues, um, and questions involving uh, alternate drug substance manufacturing sites and alter alternate drug substance suppliers. I did include a link uh, toward the end of the presentation uh, to the NextGen portal where you can submit controlled correspondence. So for the next few slides, uh, we're going to talk about effective communication between applicants and DNMF holders. Uh, primarily, we're going to offer some of our observations and advice uh, into problem areas uh, and areas where we think that improvements in communication between the applicant and the holder can really help the overall DMF and application review process. Again, it is critical for a smooth and efficient review process that applicants and DMF holders are communicating with each other effectively. Um, it can help avoid unnecessary delays to approvals, uh, things like goal date extensions. Um, and again, FDA's role is to facilitate these communications, uh, but the actual communication is up to you. So while we can provide you information that you can use uh, during these communications, um, applicants and DMF holders have to be proactive um, in pursuing these critical communications to keep the process as smooth as possible. Um, and, and from our perspective, uh, poor communication is often a barrier to first cycle approvals, unfortunately. Uh, one area where we believe that better communication between the applicant and the DMF holder um, could really improve the overall review process uh, is with unsolicited amendments uh, submitted late in the application review cycle to the drug master file. Uh, poorly timed unsolicited amendments to the DMF continue to adversely impact application timelines. Uh, they can result in goal date extensions or unnecessary CR letters to, to the DMF holder and the applicant. Um, and most unsolicited amendments in our experience do not need to be submitted at the particular time they are received. There is some flexibility as to when the unsolicited amendment can come into the drug master file. Um, we believe that communication between the applicant and the DMF holder uh, regarding DMF submission timelines for these unsolicited amendments and an awareness on the part of the DMF holder of the application timelines that the submission could potentially impact um, are really the keys to solving this issue. Um, again, it's the agency's uh, role to facilitate this. So we can provide up-to-date status information on the DMF uh, to the applicant and the holder. Um, if DMF holders are unsure if an unsolicited amendment will impact an application timeline, they can always reach out to, the, to us, uh, let us know what the change they plan to submit in the amendment um, and what their submission timeline is. And we can tell them uh, when we believe it would cause a problem so that they can avoid submitting it and being disruptive to the applicant. Another area where we think that better communication between applicants and DMF holders could really improve the overall review process is with regard to the DMF facilities that are supporting a particular application. Um, accurate facility information is critical for a timely application review. Uh, these do require a lot of planning and um, consume a lot of agency resources, especially when inspections are involved. Um, and a DMF-related facility that is discovered late in a review process can adversely impact uh, approval actions. Um, if you looked at the talk by uh, Jayani Pereira, um, 
she went into detail about how we try to use the TCIR process to spot the facility discrepancies between an application and DMF as early as possible. Um, but the relatively large number of discrepancies that we see does indicate to us that there is, on a lot of occasions, a lack of communication regarding uh, which facilities in the DMF are supporting the application. Um, applicants should have visibility on all the facilities in the DMF that are impacting the application, the manufacturing routine release and stability sites. Um, we do recommend that if there are sites in the master file uh, that are not being used to support a specific application, that that be indicated in the LOA so it's unambiguous which facilities are being used for that application. Um, industry could, could do a little bit better job of identifying the critical intermediate sites um, that are manufacturing uh, late stage intermediates because many of these facilities will need to be evaluated but are, are often um, not uh, revealed to the applicant. Um, FDA can't share DMF rela related facility information with an applicant if the facility is not disclosed to them uh, and included in their application. Um, so that could lead to uh, the unfortunate situation where uh, an application can't proceed to approval and we're not able to discuss it with them because it's related to a facility that's not included in the application. Here we have compiled a list of helpful email addresses and links to FDA guidance. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box provided for inclusion into the Q&A panel at the conclusion of this session. For questions after the session, please send those to the link provided here by March 19th for inclusion in the follow-on webinar on April the 9th. You can also refer to the following poster presentations and talks for related content.